Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next session. Today, our presenters are Kelsey Schaefer, the Creative Technologies Librarian, Chris Vinson, the head of technology, the head of library technology, and Freda Owens, the Information and Security Services Manager, all at Clemson University. And today they are going to be talking about the technology equipment loan programs at their library. Um, thank you, Megan. Can everyone hear us okay? Um, yes. Let us know if you can't. Um, we're glad to be presenting with you guys today, and thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, we'll be sure to try to leave some time at the end for question and answers as well. Um, Hi, good morning. Kelsey uh, is with um, us right. as well. At time, I give it a couple extra moments so um, we can go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for being here with us today. Um, we are going to be talking about technology equipment loan programs um, and thinking through impact modification and trends. Um, so, and uh, there will be three of us working through this today. Sorry, can we go back, Chris? Um, <laughs> um, we are all from Clems Clemson Libraries. I'm Kelsey Schaefer. I'm the Creative Technologies Librarian. We also have Chris Vinson with us, who's the head of library technology, and Freda Owens, who is the circulation manager. Um, and so all of us play different roles in relationship to the technology equipment. Um, and we're going to run through, basically what we're gonna talk about first is um, history of the Clemson program, how the Clemson program works. Um, then going to talk a bit about um, programs at other schools, which we've done, we've gathered the research, talk about COVID modifications, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, feel free to pop questions in the chat or um, save them for the end. And our contact information is on the last slide. Um, but if you have questions about that before, then um, just let us know and I can pop our emails in the chat as well. All right, we'll get started. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the history of the program. In uh, around 2000, Freda, it looks like you're talking, but I can't hear you. Oh, wait. I can I can hear her. Yeah, sorry, that was my fault. I was going to say I I thought I did a sound check. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, good. Um, around 2000 2001, the library started our technology program with a large number of laptops. We had about 30 or 40 at the time. And it was a very popular program, but we soon ran into issues with battery life and maintaining the charge level on the laptop. And so um, we ended up having to try to put more money into the program with more batteries to replace issues we were having. And around 2003, Clemson changed their program um, requirements so that all incoming freshmen had to have a laptop. Um, so that kind of helped with the cessation of our laptop program. Um, but students still wanted to check them out occasionally as they would come to the library. But our official program probably began, began around 2014 um, when our library administration designated around $8,000 a year for our technology budget. Um, prior to this, we had a few purchases here and there that we would purchase from units, supply funds and such or on an ad hoc basis for checkout. So this um, $8,000 a year started us out with a small yet manageable program. And as time went on, it was evident that we needed someone to assist in organizing, preparing and managing the program as we added this 8,000 every year to our um, circulating funds. So occasionally we would buy larger ticket items like cameras, DSLRs, camcorders, and um, the turnaround on those was very popular. It was a very popular program. We had um, wait lists often. So through changes in our leadership around 2014, 2015, we had an interim dean who decided to jumpstart our program and added $20,000 to the program. So this was a significant increase to our um, items and our availability and really kick-started the program and made it even more popular. We also started advertising more around this time because we felt like we had more items to choose from and we needed to do a better job of representing what we had and 
teaching students how this could be integrated into the learning requirements for their classes. Around this time, the library also received funding from um, two Prince Award recipients. And this is an award on our campus in which, um, in conjunction with a liaison, a awarded faculty member can spend a predetermined amount of funds for the library. Traditionally, most of the time, they chose collections, journals, or other library materials. However, for the 14, 15, and 15, 16 year, um, the recipients chose to help fund more equipment. The first year um, we had an award and the recipient wanted to purchase virtual reality. Um, that was a great idea, we thought, um, but lessons learned showed us that um, no free puppy is ever free. And those often come with lots of um, other things that you need to buy, such as gaming, um, controllers, um, you know, different different things like that. And it also takes a person who knows and understands gaming. Um, Self-admittedly, that is not me. Um, so we had a good bit to learn and catch up on just being able to ready the VR equipment for checkout for each person. As many of you know, VR equipment is often tied to one particular user's account. So we had to find workarounds to make this a um, item that could actually circulate. So we learned a few things from that experience and the next year worked with the recipient to be more focused in our purchases so that we could find things that actually supported what we already had um, in our offering. So we feel like we learned a, a good deal from that experience. Um, I think I'm ready for the next slide, Chris. Thank you. Um, for our logistics, um, we currently check out most items for around three days. Originally, it was of about a year, uh, sorry, not a year, a week, um, except our cards, cables, and accessories, which we check out for three hours. We currently require reservations and have no renewals, um, and our checkouts are housed in um, circulation at our library services desk. Again, prior to this, we tried one week checkouts, but we found that it was difficult to meet all of our patron needs as the program grew and as the popularity grew as well. They are, um, again, the items are loaned from our major service, our main service desk on the fourth floor of Cooper Library. And Chris, if you'll click on the website there, um, our website is set up so that students can scroll through our list of available items. They are not linked into Alma or our library system to show availability because um, we're currently obviously having to quarantine items, um, but it does give a brief description about what the item is, what it can be used for, the checkout period. Um, there's also some information on overdue, period, overdue fines and also links to help materials online, such as user guides. When a student wants to make a reservation, they simply go to this website, fill out the form, and they'll receive a separate email confirmation on the day that they want to pick up an item. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey now, who's going to talk a little bit about how our program is broken down into what types of materials. Yes, great. And sorry about that. At, for, um, at the beginning, my sound was not outputting, so I think there was some weirdness. But anyway, we're all caught up. Um, so uh, we have a hundred uh, or a thousand four hundred and forty-five um, items that are part of the technology equipment, which is only about um, one percent of the overall collection. Um, and we'll show some usage stats and um, budget information in future slides, but just to give an idea of what exactly we're talking about loaning, um, Clemson has a pretty robust tech equipment loan program. Um, I've worked at other libraries as well um, with kind of a range of, um, uh, of size of program and depth of program. So it's pretty exciting to be at Clemson and, and see how all this plays out and also how much usage it gets. Um, but just to break it down a bit of that 100 or 1,000, 1,400, um, you know, a large portion of that is going to be broken up, broken down into um, 
the items that are kind of small ticket items, they're cheaper, but we have kind of mass quantities of them. And that's generally the adapters, cables, and chargers. So um, we have, you know, USB adapters, that kind of thing, um, USB cables. Uh, we also have, we, we have gone in and out of um, loaning laptop chargers. Um, there was some concern about safety and like what would happen if uh, the charger didn't work or, or broke the computer or whatever, but that was a highly requested item. Um, so we started doing that again more recently. And, and again, those are you know getting really high usage. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we, those adapters, cables and chargers loan for um, three hours rather than, or for, you know, a set number of hours other than three days. Um, we also, you can see, have a lot of calculators. Those are um, generally the short items as well. Um, and then miscellaneous things. Well, I'll get to miscellaneous in a minute. Um, some of the most highly used items, of course, are the, um, the cameras and camcorders. So we have, um, in terms of video cameras, we do have camcorders, which when I, um, try to advertise for these or um, promote them in classes that I'm teaching, um, you know, I will joke that they kind of look like what maybe like a dad uses to record a soccer game. <laughs> um, and sometimes I don't have as much appeal to the students for that reason, they're not super cool. Um, and also camera or phone cameras have caught up so much. So um, we're kind of on the verge now, both Clemson and a, a lot of other schools thinking through um, how best to support video and uh, photography needs given basically the rise of really great smartphone cameras. Um, but we do have camcorders for people that need that or that need kind of longer recordings. That's usually what we get. And the camcorders are quite good, especially we have a couple really good ones. Um, I do find everywhere I've been, people really use DSLRs, which are, um, they're like digital cameras with interchangeable lenses. People really prefer to use those for video. They're not really built to be video cameras. Um, so that's part of why it's, interesting that there's this prevalence everywhere for uh, or preference everywhere for people to use students to use those but I think again they um, look cooler they're, they're used to kind of uh, what those look like actually and this is that would be an area of investigation is that I've talked about with people is like why people um, have such a strong preference for using DSLRs which again are made for photography and not for video um, we also have accessories for photo and video, video so like tripods we also have interchangeable lenses for those cameras um, and some external flashes we have a green screen that people can check out so all sorts of things to support people making digital media projects we also have within that audio and podcasting so some audio recorders and microphones um, a lot of and i will say uh i'll talk about this later one of the things that we want to do is assess more um but we know that this that a lot of these items are being used for class projects. Um, so especially the video, uh, photo and audio pro um, pieces of equipment are being used for, um, you know, when someone's asked to make a video for class or podcast for class. And we're just gonna continue seeing more projects like that at the university, I think. Um, so it's exciting that we can support that. Um, and I can talk at length about, um, especially the audio and podcasting, but in general, how we choose these um, and there's a kind of standard across the board. We're looking for um, items that are pretty robust um, and that you know aren't going to break instantly. Um, but also, you want to use something, find something that is easy to use. And I think that's kind of the hardest thing to find because you want something that's good quality, right? That will like record something really well, but also um, isn't too complicated for people. And I think that that's the main. Um, issue that people run up against when buying like high end video cameras. And often the students will say, oh, I want the, you know, the nicest camera that's available, um, but it will be, you know, too complicated for them to use. And so then how do we kind of split the difference, give them something that's really good to record with, but also easy to use or provide more training. Um, and also to, to delve a little bit into the support. Um, that's another thing that we're trying to figure out is exactly how to support uh, people using these things. So how best to provide guides or um, manuals or that kind of thing with the information. And also um, how do we provide in-person support in the best way? So right now, when someone checks out a piece of equipment, they can ask at the main desk um, how to use it. Um, 
if the people at the main desk know, they will provide that information or they'll send them up to an alternative service desk, which is the Adobe Digital Studio, which is what I run. Um, and I have interns that work there. Of course, this is pre-COVID. Um, who are able to provide more information about using the cameras. But I don't think actually a lot of people make that journey up the stairs. <laughs> um, so we're losing something a little bit there. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, other, oh, and we have, we have a few different kinds of microphones um, and including we have some microphones for video as well. And then the other is some fun stuff like tablets, um, media players, we have a GPS tracker, we have a metal detector, so, so just some like fun things. I've worked at um, other places that had like um, a telescope for checkout. Um, it's fun to get these kind of one-off things that might expand people's creativity. Uh, so just an idea of the different, the scope of the program. Um, the most used items are definitely um, the adapters, cables, and chargers, and then the video and photography, those kinds of cameras. Um, the tablets get a lot of use. Um, Right. Okay, um, so as Kelsey mentioned, Clemson does have a fairly robust uh, tech loan program, and that's really represented um, from this outsized proportion of our overall lending from physical materials that tech loans represents. So um, tech loans represents 21% on average of our uh, overall loan counts, uh, at least through 2018 through 2020. Um, when you look at the data month by month, you'll see that this average also includes large dips in those loans during the summer months. Um, so in reality, this data really demonstrates that usage during peak times in the spring and fall semesters really approaches closer to, and in some cases over 30%. So um, it's a huge portion of what we check out in terms of physical materials um, when you stack it against our um, book collection, our media collection, um, it holds on its own pretty well. Um, the usage and the popularity of the tech lending program is especially remarkable when you consider the relatively modest investments that we put into the collection on an annual basis. So all told, the valuation of our current circulating collection across the three branches that we have at Clemson comes in just under $162,000. Um, in many cases, that number is lower than the amount expended on a single database package per year. Um, so it's not really that, that high a value when you compare it to other things that we have. Um, for this fiscal year, we have uh, $20,000 encumbered for tech lending. Um, overall, that encumbrance represents a mere 0.22% of our full collections budget, uh, which is roughly $8.8 .8 million. Um, just let that sink in. Over one fifth of our circulating physical collection is supported by 0.22% of the budget. Um, I think that really speaks to the um, value of the collection beyond its actual dollar value. Um, I think it's also an important lesson to think about and acknowledge how tech lending is not just a service, but it is also a collection. I think when you frame it in those terms, it helps put the amount of investment into perspective when you're comparing it to the other collections uh, that you invest in as a library. Um, all of a sudden, a number that may have shocked leadership at your library, five or $10,000 for some cameras, uh, really doesn't sound like so much when you compare it to our other collections, what we spend on those, and the demonstrable return on investment that you see based on that tech usage, popularity, the goodwill it builds in the community and the positive press that it generates. And also one thing there to Chris, um, the branches, um, we do have the tech equipment loan program broken into uh, we have the main library at Clemson is Cooper. Um, and so you can see the portion of the budget there. EMC is the Educational Media Center. Um, and that budget is, so they have a lot of items there that are, um, some of them are just for use by the College of Education and they, the, that budget is also provided by the College of Education um, for training teachers that are working with digital media. Um, but also there's um, some things outside of tech necessarily like specifically technology equipment, um, kits and things. Uh, so you'll see that's that's a kind of unique situation at Clemson. And then um, the architecture branch library also has a portion, um, especially for cameras and that kind of thing.
So we started, we've talked about this a little bit so far, um, kind of spaced throughout the Clemson program, um, but just thinking through um, some lessons learned broken down into policies, budget and staffing. Um, I'll start with the maintenance. So uh, things break all the time, <laughs> um, both big and small. So it's pretty easy when, um, a adapter breaks to like get a new one, but it does take it out of circulation. And if it's an adapter that you need for like a DSLR, that means that whole DSLR camera, which is in high demand is taken out of circulation. So, um, you know, that's again, going back to the idea of choosing items that are within, um, you know, often you wanna pick something that comes from a big name company that, you know, that has good customer service that you can get replacement parts from them for a long time. So it goes into choosing items um, and also thinking about having backups on hand if you need. Um, having that consumable budget makes a big difference for the items that are replaced often. In addition to having a, a budget for consumables, um, I will point out that um, one of the one of the most important things I, I can say about the staff who do run the program here in our area is that they are kind of hands on learn as you go. We have been able to um, hold on to kits and lenses and cameras that may not be working appropriately, but that we think we could part out <laughs> and piece out. And um, our current technology coordinator is really good at trying to, for example, replace a screen on a camera with another camera that the camera might, the body might not work, but the lens is still good. So um, if you have somebody who's willing to Google things and, and learn as they go, it is possible to, um, you know, find ways to, to get the most out of your budget dollars. Um, lessons learned about policies, I'll, I'll go through those a bit. Um, one thing that we learned that was really important was to have our library write and approve a, pos a policy um, that our front staff could refer to. It's if the person at the front desk is having to tell somebody, no, you can't renew it or a department deny a departmental request, it really helps them from a customer service standpoint to have something in writing that they can refer to. Um, it's also a good idea to establish procedures and working relationships with other offices on campus to ensure that your efforts at retrieving non-returned items is um, set up beforehand, that you set that process up beforehand. For example, we, um, we tried to make sure that our police department um, knew that we circulated materials and what the items would look like and what kind of tags they would have on them. Um, we've even talked to our CAT bus um, transportation system on campus and our financial system on campus. Uh, we previously had a girl who left a very expensive camcorder on a CAT bus and um, the driver of the bus knew that it belonged to us. We had it appropriately labeled and he knew the steps to get it back to us. Um, similarly, we had a girl who wouldn't return items and had probably about $8,000 worth of technology checked out. Um, I could not get her to return my phone calls. I tried sending letters to her home, um, to try contacting her parents. Um, but I finally got the material back when I sent a police officer to visit her in her class. So um, having those relationships with the police or your Office of Community and Ethical Standards really will help should the um, unthinkable happen and you have to start working on trying to locate some missing materials. For staffing, um, we found that it was really important to consider the extra workload, not just on the person managing and coordinating the program, but also the other staff at your service desk. We found that it was really important um, for everyone working our service desk to know a good bit about the policies, the procedures, and how to operate each piece of equipment because your technology coordinator isn't gonna be here at 10 o'clock at night when someone's running in for a last minute project that's due the next morning. So that um, lovely joy is gonna be bestowed upon your, your night manager. Um, so it's important to make sure that your training goes through all of your staff um, for your front service line. It's also a good idea to make sure that you are um, working with your marketing staff, if you, have, if you have staff designated for marketing and communications. Um, 
it's important to help get the word out about how these items can be used in classes and the loan policies as well. And your front desk staff are often your best marketing assets. They have close interactions with all of your daily patron base. So um, consider things like that when you are setting up, um, for example, we did a petting zoo and it was open to anybody in the library, anybody who worked here, anybody external to students. And we would just set up in the lobby and have people come by and um, talk to us about the stuff. You know, what is this? What can I use it for? How long can I check it out? What's it overdue fine? Um, sometimes technology can be a bit intimidating. So we found that these technology petting zoos were very helpful in helping people feel more comfortable with the technology. It's also important to remember to reach out to your um, marketing staff who are putting out your social media to help publicize important upcoming dates for um, end of the semester things like graduation or debt turnover. So at the end of every semester, we do a special um, broadcast message to our students to remind them to turn, over, turn in any overdue technology and also to um, pay any overdue fines so that we don't hinder your graduation. Um, it's also important when establishing your policies to make sure that you either have a policy or you write yours into um, your, your um, procedures in a way that ties into your campus policy on illegal activity. Um, if there's illegal material on the cameras, when you're reviewing them for, um, for example, when we get them back, we have to check for battery life and um, format of SD cards. So if we find illegal activity on the cameras, we turn those over to university officials. So make sure that that's stated in your policy. Um, lastly, it's also important to um, consider making it a part of your procedure uh, to have frequent offenders come in and actually have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with your service desk manager or your technology um, coordinator. We have found that that's a good way to kind of stave off frequent um, flyers, people who get something and then don't return it for a month, um, or people who just are frequently breaking things. Um, sometimes I have to have a little come to Jesus conversation with people and I find that once they've come in and had that conversation, um, they realize the importance of the program because I try to impress upon them, you know, the longer you keep this, you're making someone else not have this technology available. So you're hindering your fellow students. Um, but also you can usually find out why they're late, you know, maybe they have trouble with um, parking or maybe they are struggling with something else that you can refer them to another campus service. Um, so we've been able to make some good contacts that way and get some students some assistance in ways that they needed just by having them come in and have conversations about why they're being a frequent offender. So that's a little bit about the policies and staffing. Um, Chris is going to talk a little bit about budget. Yeah, uh, so to wrap up the lessons learned um, in terms of budget, uh, you, as Kelsey had mentioned with maintenance and including a consumable budget, you also want to include um, budgeting for things like cases and accessories, uh, extra batteries, uh, things to clean uh, the uh, equipment, things like that uh, really eat into your, your overall budget. So it's important to keep those in mind as you, as you set that money aside. Um, we also learned and would advise that you buy the most sturdy option um, just because uh, this material gets so much more wear and tear um, than they would under a single owner um, who may be trying to make a certain piece of equipment last forever. Um, we have students who may or may not uh, care what actually happens to the camera um, <laughs> and they get lots of wear and tear. So um, you wanna buy something that's sturdy uh, and something that um, can withstand uh, multiple uses by different people. Um, I think one of the most important lessons learned in terms of budget is uh, keeping in mind that you need to uh, buy what you know you can support. Um, so Freda had alluded earlier to um, a fund that we had received to purchase some VR uh, equipment uh, to make uh, uh, circulating through our collection. And um, 
over time, we found that it was really difficult to support that VR collection because we didn't really know a lot about it. Um, we didn't know a lot about how to use the technology. We didn't know a lot about how it was being used by the students who were checking it out or by the faculty member who was assigning VR projects. So um, we advise that you buy what you know you can support so that you don't end up in a situation where you're just handing off technology without any idea of kind of, you know, the context around it. So um, it's really important to keep that in mind. And whatever you buy, um, you need to justify with usage stats, with, um, with stories, anything that you can find about, um, about your equipment and how people are using it, being able to create a narrative about why this equipment and why this collection is uh, instrumental in delivering services and uh, value to, to our patrons. Okay, so that was our overview of the Clemson program um, from start to current, or I guess kind of up until March of 2020. So um, we'll talk more about COVID towards the end. Um, but part of what I've been really interested in is um, doing some assessment of both the Clemson program and understanding how um, the technology equipment loan program works at other schools. So we found uh, Clemson, put, Clemson Libraries put together a uh, research, a, a report on what it means, what it would take for Clemson to become a research one library. Um, and one of the things that we were looking at is our creative technology offerings. And we did a survey of other of our peer institutions. So um, that was kind of pretty narrowly defined uh, aspirational peer institutions, which were like um, uh, land grant, R1 institutions with no medical school, I think is what it narrowed down to. So there were about 12. Um, and we found uh, when looking at the creative technology offerings that they had, um, all of the 12 peer institutions had technology loan programs. So that's really promising and exciting. And I, I'm also really interested in um, kind of how the programs function. So just a day-to-day, -day, you know, what's working across the different institutions. Um, as part of this long-term project to understand technology equipment programs across the country, um, or maybe in the Southeast, however we define that, um, and also figure out how better to support students. So I think there's a lot of research out there about um, starting up the programs and kind of what you need to start it up. Um, there's a little bit about how they run day to day, but less about assessing them and also about looking at trends across schools. So that's, you know, this is um, starting to introduce that program. So just to say, you know, of our aspirational peers, um, 12 of them have technology loan programs. And then, you know, I find the rest of this data pretty interesting too. Uh, so here's a giant table, which I know is maybe overwhelming. Um, I get I was having a hard time figuring out a better way to, um, to visualize each of these elements. So I'll go through, um, this is just research that I did uh, and, and it all happened pre, I did this research pre COVID. Um, so just looking at our aspirational peer institutions and kind of how the technology loan program was working at each of them. Um, so you can see in terms of enrollment, um, which is that first, you can see all of our peer institutions and then the enrollment. Um, Clemson's kind of in the middle, but low, kind of low in terms of enrollment. And um, you'll see on the next slide, it is, it does seem that the tech equipment, oh, sorry, not quite yet. Um, the tech equipment uh, does happen at um, larger institutions, um, of course, where there's more money to kind of get it off the ground. You do need that startup money um, and need the demand, I think. Um, so uh, there's a link and you'll have access to this. We'll make sure you do. But um, so I found a lot of this information from the tech loan page. I'm interested in what everybody calls it because that's makes it a little hard to study to find um, research about it because we all call it different things. At Clemson, we call it technology checkout. You can see that there's actually no consensus. There's no, um, actually there's no two schools that call it the same thing in this list, which I found interesting. Um, so we have equipment loan, technology lending, all across the board, but kind of around the word technology and or equipment, um, and then checkout or loan or lending or something like that. Um, so I found that interesting. Um, one thing I'm looking at is whether reservations are required. Um, reservations are required at Clemson. Um, at, 
you can, uh, pre-COVID, you could walk up and fill out a reservation form um, and then get the, get the item in the moment. But the way that that works is we have that designated staff member who is managing reservations. So when someone requests a piece of equipment, um, Lori goes through and makes sure that the equipment is available and that somebody hasn't requested it for like the same time that you've requested it for or something like that. So it involves a lot of staff uh, and there's kind of no way I haven't found um, another school that that really enjoys their system of reservation. Everybody is like, yes, this is a lot of work and is it worth it? So I'm interested in that kind of question of um, you know, what students need. Where I worked at before, which was Virginia Commonwealth University at um, the workshop in the library. Um, the workshop was a designated creative technology center with um, a, a, an alternative, like a service desk, an extra service desk, and also closed. So the, um, the tech was loaned out of that desk or out of that area. At Clemson, um, the technology equipment is loaned out of the main desk. Um, and I'm also interested in that question as well, um, in part because of staffing, um, because, you know, about staff training basically, about whether people are able to provide um, the specialized knowledge that's needed, um, that can be needed to provide assistance with this. Um, equipment. So you can see those two questions interacting. Um, the reservations at Clemson again required, but um, a lot of the other schools don't offer reservations. VCU also did not offer reservations. It was a first come first serve, but you could see online um, they had you, there was a way of searching Alma basically to see if something was available. And if something was available in that moment, then you could walk up and grab it. Um, a lot of places too are moving towards no reservations, but they do offer like a special request. So for example, at um, NC State, there is a special request form that's on the website and you say, you know, what you need it for. Um, and that, ex they can extend the reservation for, um, they'll extend it for a whole semester if you have a research project or something like that, but you go through the special request to do that. NC State also has a lot more um, items. Uh, and I'm also a little unclear on some of these. That's why the no question mark, <laughs> you know, I couldn't see for sure on the website, but I did not do a survey um, where I talked to somebody directly. That would be the kind of next step of this. Um, but then you can see also that a lot of these schools do offer um, a different, you know, an alternative service desk rather than the main desk. Again, I think that's largely staff training and also space. One of the things that we really need at Clemson is more space to offer um, to hold the technology equipment. Um, you'll be able to peruse the list of equipment. I would also love to know the numbers of equipment. Um, and again, there's not great assessment for that. And then the loan period I find interesting, but most um, schools break it down into items that are loaned for um, an extended period of time. So like three days um, or short-term loans, three hours. Um, I was not able to specify about renewals. Um, so like at VCU, we did not do reservations it was first come first serve, but one renewal was offered. So you could have it for three days and then renew it for another three days. Um, Clemson, there are reservations, but um, you can only have it for three days. So, you know, everybody has a kind of different approach to this. I'm sure it's also dependent on the student population. It's dependent on um, the staff levels available, but it's interesting to see how this breaks out um, between different schools. Um, and then this is, these are again, our aspirational peers. The next slide shows, um, I tried to grab some of that same information from um, some South Carolina institutions. These are all academic libraries. Um, so, and this is not an exhaustive list. I would love to hear from others. Um, anybody that I missed, you'll see that um, we have, um, University of South Carolina has technology equipment. Um, so does Coastal Carolina has a few and College of Charleston. Um, again, this is not an exhaustive, it, it doesn't give you a ton of information because it doesn't tell you exactly what's offered. So I'm working on that. Um, we also were talking about whether public libraries are offering technology equipment, of course, um, that it's much harder, I would imagine to, um, you know, the part of what makes technology equipment work through libraries is that we have those policies in place to um, kind of recoup the equipment costs if anything goes missing, um, you know, to have something that's more expensive, I think would be hard at public libraries, but I've never worked at a public library. So I'd love to hear more from anybody about that. Um, I know that hotspots in particular have become a big thing. And then 
laptops, of course, either within use at the library or for use at the library or elsewhere. Um, this information is also the the information on this slide came from research that was more recent, so after COVID, and a lot of libraries have adjusted their websites so that it's a little harder to find some information about what's going to happen. And we also don't or what's happening now, and we don't know exactly how these programs will shake out after COVID. Um, but anyway, this is the start of kind of investigating this, um, how these programs are working at other schools. Again, in the question and answer period, would love to hear, um, you know, anything that anybody's noticed of how we're laying it out and also how we can find trends across institutions. Next. Um, in terms of uh, COVID-19 updates, again, we've kind of been alluding to this um, as we've been talking. Um, and I'll just say before Freda jumps in and talks about our COVID modifications at Clemson, um, all schools are going through modifications. Um, and I've been in conversations with um, our peer institutions and other um, Southeastern academic libraries. Um, and I just, there will be flux, I'm sure, based on um, all the updates that are happening. As Kelsey, as Kelsey said, um, we've had a lot of changes because of COVID. Uh, we decided to quarantine items seven days and short-term short -term items, such as our cables and adapters are cleaned thoroughly with um, antibacterial wipes or solution. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you have a program like this or are setting up a program um, in the middle of our COVID uncertain times is that some materials can only be cleaned with um, alcohol, especially if it's technology. So make sure that you look at the um, suppliers recommendations for cleaning. After COVID, we also found that um, some departments and faculty were interested in semester long checkouts to prepare for their online class or their migration to online classes. Um, our policy is kind of set up that it states that this program is meant to support um, student learning and engagement. So we generally don't do renewals and we generally do not um, extend checkouts for semester long um, periods. So we've had to say no to several departments. Um, unfortunately, if you are um, setting up a program, I would caution you um, to make sure that you have a policy for that or at least an internal procedure. Um, some departments, we even had several requests from our campus media and communications department. You would think that they would have their own photography and recording equipment, but we have often fielded requests for them as well. Um, while our program does set up, um, you know, the has the premise of being supportive for our students, it is available for any faculty, staff, or departmental checkout. Um, as long as it's tied to a particular person's account. Um, even with COVID and us having to quarantine items for seven days, we have found that we um, are out of requested items and have a wait list for some, even though our usage is down. Um, equipment is a good bit of what we're still doing um, with our limited services. Um, so we're finding that uh, you know, many, we were able to get most of the items back that were um, checked out pre-COVID. I think we maybe have two or three calculators that we're still trying to track down. Um, when we transitioned to curbside pickup in July, we began allowing technology requests again at that time. And um, many students were very glad to see that happening. Um, technology has also um, returned curbside in July, and we've since moved our curbside pickup to our front doors, and technology is returned to our front door area as well. There's been a couple of items that people have returned, um, classmates of um, COVID positive students have returned, and they've said, you know, this was checked out by someone who had COVID. And so we have quarantined those items just a little bit longer since some of the studies we've read said five days, some said seven days, some said 10 days. So just to be sure on the ones that were self-identified as having come from a COVID positive household or apartment, um, we, we did quarantine those 10 days. As Kelsey said, we do only accept um, advanced reservations. We have had a few that 
were put in and people said, I really need this this evening. Is there any way um, that you can meet my need? And we've been able to work with them, but for the most part, we require advanced reservations just so that we're able to best serve the students, get all of the items quarantined and safe, and also prepare the items for checkout to the next person. So just thinking, oh yeah. Um, I was just gonna say um, for future directions for the department, um, as Chris said, VR is a difficult thing. Um, so we're looking forward to try to move it out of circulation and into its own dedicated space as um, things are moved around in the library or as more space becomes available. Um, we're also finding with advances in technology that we need more low end technology that works with um, the higher end cameras for example, um, microphones that will hook up to a person's cell phone. We also find that we have more, of the, more requests for specialized high-end cameras and lenses and video cameras. And as was alluded to earlier, we're, um, we're also transitioning to more single, one single company rather than branching out and offering a, a variety of company cameras. Some people are diehard Nikon people, some people are diehard Canon, but we're finding that if we have a single company that we support or have here at the library, it makes it easier as far as training the staff, training the students, um, and also having attachments and accessories that are universal and can work across our program. So for that reason, we've recently decided to phase out our Nikon collection and move towards um, Canon just so that we can have um, a more simplistic um, back end to the program. And then another thing we're looking at for future directions is um, again better assessment which I've talked about throughout this but um, we are close to being able to implement like a survey slash feedback form um, that I think will provide more information about. Uh, I'm interested in how the students are using them. Again, we, we don't know actually if they're using it for school projects or personal projects. Um, and also if they have the information um, or knowledge to be able to use it. So whether it would be helpful to have a guide um, printed out and put into the thing if they need that or not, if they need that in the bag um, or if they need a link to it or if they need more in-person training, um, all of that, it's there's a hole there in terms of our knowledge. So we want to uh, better understand that and better support that for Clemson and also would love to share that information out. Oh, and uh, finally, to touch on some of the uh, future directions, um, long term, operationally speaking, um, as Freda mentioned, one thing we would like to do is move VR out of circulation and into a dedicated space. Um, sort of the, the caveat there is that we need to find more space. Um, we do have a vision eventually for uh, one of our floors in the library uh, to become the tech floor, um, which has a lot of associated services revolving around technology uh, spaced close together, um, including the creative technology space and the Adobe Digital Studio um, and some other technology initiatives we have going on. So long term identifying spaces that make sense with each other um, for this type of collection. Um, on top of that, um, more space and more collection also should include more staff. Um, right now we share staff with other circulation, someone who has other circulation duties. So um, having a dedicated manager for this collection and this service, I think would be instrumental in its long-term success. Um, also, if we ever plan to grow the program, um, not just, um, a single manager, but also interns, students to support that so that we can um, grow the service a little more. And uh, we have been mostly focused in our talk today on um, the collection in Cooper, but uh, we do have uh, two other collections in our other branches, and uh, we want to work towards having more consistency and equal opportunity uh, for equipment collections across all of our branches. Uh, essentially, just um, I think we do a really good job of it already, but just making sure that um, we all kind of have the same types of training, 
uh, we offer the same types of equipment so that our patrons have a familiar experience no matter where they go within the library system. Um, and in that same regard, making sure that all branches have equal opportunity for um, purchasing and making that equipment available um, so that it's not just restricted to one to one program or to one library. And that is the close of our talk. Um, thank you for your time today. Uh, at this point, uh, we would love to take your questions. I have a question. Yes, great. Um, so uh, if it's all right to ask. Um, so for laptops, um, as far as locking them down, making sure you wipe all passwords, personal information, software settings from the prior um, borrower, um, what were you doing for that? We currently don't check out laptops here at Cooper. Um, our Education Media Center does. Um, and I believe that they use, um, they let the students log on with their Clemson username and password and it kind of saves their items to the cloud. Chris can probably speak more to that. At Cooper, we no longer check out laptops, um, but we did have iPads for a while and moved those, transitioned those to the um, media center as well to help focus on the um, education programs there. Mm -hmm. But the, the iPads were reformatted um, at the end when every time they were brought back. Okay, by the staff every time they were reformatted yeah. upon yeah. return. Okay. Yeah, and as Fredo was mentioning, I, I, I think it's um, uh, accurate to say that in terms of what the Education Media Center is doing is um, the laptops are treated more or less like public PCs. So um, the student would come in, log in with their information, um, do their thing, and then once they log off, all information, all history would be wiped um, and ready for the next use. You know if that was done with a particular software or if was it deep freeze or yes okay yeah deep freeze yeah they were um we had a ghost image that we would use to apply to each one when it came back okay okay um also so as far as lending out um you, you would never ask for any kind of collateral um, if it was an on the spot thing, it's just, here's my student ID, go ahead and borrow. You don't have to ask for any collateral, like an ID or whatever. Correct. Yes. As long as they were an active and valid student, um, and our, we do a patron load daily. So if they're an active and valid student, faculty or staff, they were extended technology privileges. Our technology program was not available to our community patrons or alumni. Um, but we do have item costs um, so that's one thing when you're looking into setting up a program or improving your current program it's important to make sure that you have item costs in each record when you're setting them up mm -hmm. so that in the case of non-return the person can be billed for them so at the end of each semester if the students didn't return something i um, take those fines and fees and send them over to our um, receivables office and they're either pre prevented from registering for classes or graduating if, if they're a candidate for graduation. Did staff outline exactly what the consequences were for, for non-returning um, yeah. or did you have a waiver to is, sign? Um, our policy has it and you have to click that you agree to the policy oh, okay. before you're able to add your name to our reservation form online. And if back when we were doing in-person reservations, the um, the policy was on the little card that they had to sign and check what they wanted and then sign the reverse of it saying that they agreed to the policy. Okay. And um, was part of the policy, did you mention, you know, at a certain point, we may inform the police if you don't return certain right. items? We do. Um, we let them know that, um, that they are checking the item out for educational purposes that the item um, needs to be returned in the same uh, state and condition that it was checked out in, and that non-return will be um, followed up with university officials and um, offices as, as required, meaning the police, student receivables, 
um, or refer to a collection agency if necessary. Was there all, a all which we've done? Right, right. Was there a certain price point? I mean, would you inform the police for a hundred dollar item, or was it you know a little larger than that? Typically, we only went to the police or the Office of Community and Ethical Standards if it was something that was. A, you know, of great value. I don't typically go to them for a graphing calculator or a voice recorder, um, but I'm not opposed to it. <laughs> <laughs> because, and the reason I say that is you have to keep in mind that while it may just be a $100 item or a $300 item, that person keeping it is preventing other students from having the same benefits that that person has. So it's really um, an equality and fairness issue as far as accessibility to the technology. So if someone else is um, keeping something out too long or being habitual in the way that they are checking items out, um, you know, then it, it's my responsible, responsibility as a manager to make sure that they understand the, um, the importance of returning the item back. Mm -hmm. um, and typically we get really i get really good success um, by contacting parents i don't share what the person has um, checked out because of confidentiality i just say that they have an important matter to discuss with us here at the library and they need to have their son or daughter um, contact us as soon as possible and usually if they get two or three of those phone calls um, their son or daughter usually come in and say can you please stop calling my mama and, and so <laughs> that usually works pretty well yeah, at a public library, I don't think we can always call call mom, but <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, well, thank you for your answers. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you, Kelsey, Chris, and Rita for your presentation. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording because I do have another session that starts at noon. Um, but